Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is um, talk about kind of turning to climate change and the need for information at the right resolution to meet the needs of society to really understand the impacts and how those are affecting people in our uh, various uh, societal systems as well as ecosystems. Um, and unfortunately, the most of the information we generally get is from global models that um, don't have sufficient resolution to do that. So if we look at overall the science of climate change, you know, we all know that the temperature is rising, uh, but it's not just all about global warming. It's really what, what really matters to society is what's happening, um, not only with those temperatures, but what is happening to severe weather and the fact that it's becoming more intense, more heat waves, more large precipitation events, more droughts, and other types of events that mostly won't go into today. So, so it's not just all about global warming, it's really looking at all of these other effects as well and being able to represent them as we try to provide the right kind of information that is needed. We know this is important because if you look at the NOAA analysis of the billion dollar events, we've gone from several events such year to now having 20 or more such events every year. Um, and it's costing the taxpayers a great deal of money as a result because of all those resulting impacts and trying to deal with uh, uh, the resulting effects on, on humanity. So if we look at the global models that I mentioned before, the Earth system models basically are, today's models are basically one or two degrees um, resolution. It's 100 kilometers um, by 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers by 200 kilometer horizontal resolution, which is too coarse for the type of impact analysis that are really needed. Um, and so those results need to be downscaled uh, and bias corrected. Um, and there's basically two approaches for doing that. And my group does both, but um, looking at dynamical downscaling, and I'm, which I'm not gonna talk about today, where we use a regional model. And in our case, we've been looking at all of North America um, in downscaling to four kilometer resolution. But that's very, very expensive computationally. So it's difficult to get enough years to really provide the kind of analyses that are needed. The other approach is relatively inexpensive to do, but requires a great deal of thinking to do it properly. And that's called statistical downscaling. And so this uh, basically downscaling uses information from the observations combined with the output from the global models to generate high resolution climate projections that are closely aligned with those observations. And then from what we learn um, from in the statistical downscaling is then to apply what we learn to the projections of, of climate. What I'm gonna talk about uh, today is uh, the STAR approach, which is seasonal trends and analysis of residuals. Uh, this is an approach that uh, um, I developed with several of my former students, uh, Catherine Hayo and Ann Stoner. Um, and uh, the paper uh, that we wrote is now in press in uh, Earth's future. Unfortunately, the final version isn't quite out yet. But it's intended to be a rapid, flexible, and generalizable approach to bias correcting and downscaling climate model output to any observational data set. STAR can also be applied using predictors, predictants from global regional climate models, satellites, reanalysis, and weather stations. So it's sensibly, it's a new software package based on signal decomposition algorithms with the concept that different components of temporal signal may differ in various ways between the model and observations and may respond to human induced climate change differently. In other words, what we're trying to do is fit the past observations 
an effective way based on understanding of the science to be able to um, show how the model on in a driven grid cell differs from the observed um, diurnal variation or um, you know, all the way out to annual, how the shape of the historical annual cycle, um, the climatology differs from the observed climatology, and also looking at daily availability or weather, where you get those extremes for the GCM's grid cells and how those differ from local variability. So I don't want to show you a comparison with other techniques, but basically what we find is that, that new technique in comparison with our, our former and technique arm, which at the time was one of the better techniques out there, um, uh, that there's vast improvement. In this case, looking at temperature uh, for the 50% uh, quartile versus 1% and 99.9%, uh, the star far exceeds the capabilities, particularly in the extremes. If you were to look at other uh, approaches, like Delta, for example, which is commonly used, um, they do well in the median, but they don't capture the extremes accurately. And so this, this approach is really designed to be able to capture the extremes much, much more rapidly. Similarly with precipitation, in fact, precipitation is where most of the techniques really break down. Um, and again, star far out does arm. And despite the fact that arm was one of the better techniques out there. Now, applying star to the Great Lakes, um, this is an analysis looking at uh, the recent trends in temperature, first of all. Uh, so it's 2002 to 2021 versus 1901 to 1960 with the model trained on the earlier time period. And, um, and we see that the, the region, first of all, has about a 1.1 degree increase in temperature uh, since 1901 uh, to 2.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and you particularly see that more of that is at the higher latitudes than at the lower latitudes, but it does vary across um, the region. Now, in these analyses, the applications so far, we have only looked at uh, the continental United States. That is going to change. We're currently actually trying to apply um, the technique globally. So looking at the forecast of the future, just to remind you of the scenarios that uh, scientists use, um, the, there's a whole range of different scenarios. We're going to focus today on the high scenario, SSP 8.5, 5.8.5, um, and uh, this kind of the third scenario from the top, uh, SSP 2, 4.5. Uh, the bottom two scenarios, uh, and, and, and I should mention, those are probably the most likely cases of what's going to happen. The lowest two cases are, are aimed at achieving one and a half and two degrees centigrade, well, the, uh, the aim of the Paris Agreement. I can tell you quite well that the 1.5 degree is, is not going to be achieved. We're going to shoot well beyond that in the next decade. Two degrees is still possible, but it'll, everything there depends on what we do now between now and 2060 to reduce emissions. Um, so it is possible you could get that low, but probably not. Probably you're going to be more like the 4.5 or something higher. And we've been following the highest one, basically, uh, historically. And these, the two graphs here, one shows carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, and the other shows the resulting temperature. And there's a big difference in the temperature. So if we start talking about a temperature change globally in annual average, currently of, of two degrees Fahrenheit or 1.1 degrees uh, centigrade, uh, that's actually a, a very significant change in climate when you consider that the last ice age was about 10 degrees Fahrenheit or about five degrees centigrade uh, decrease in temperature. And yet we had thousands of feet of ice uh, probably above where you were sitting. So, 
looking at the projections of the future, I'll just show you a few select cases. This is for the, the end of the century, 2070 to 2099, relative to the current time period. And the high case gives a result of about 5.4 degree centigrade increase, 9.8 degrees Fahrenheit, so about comparable in warming to what we saw in cooling for the last ice age. Um, whereas the low scenarios is quite a bit smaller and showing the, really the benefits of uh, mitigation and how reducing emissions can have over the coming decades of 3.2 degree increase uh, or 5.7 degree Fahrenheit. And again, if you look at the analysis, the, the, uh, you know, for these annual changes in temperature, they show higher latitudes having, or higher, you know, higher latitudes having um, the more significant change relative to lower latitudes. What happened here? They seem to be locked up. I'm probably going to skip right by it. Oops, that's what happened. I skipped right by everything. <laughs> Okay, come on. So if we look at pre precipitation, I think maybe I'm trying to get back one more. There we go. So the next graph, um, which should come up hopefully, um, shows looking at extreme temperature variations and shows that days above 90 degrees uh, by the middle or end of the century are, are likely to increase dramatically in the Great Lakes region. And uh, likewise, that the number of days below freezing, um, there it is, um, are likely to decrease significantly by uh, almost two months in the high, uh, for the high scenario um, by the end of the century and by a month under the low scenario. And if we look at precipitation, precipitation has already increased about 10% in the Great Lakes region over the last century, particularly in the winter and spring. And the model analyses and the downscaling project that in, we will see a, another roughly 10% by 2100 but it does depend to somewhat on what scenario. Basically, you get the same kind of signal that, um, and by the way, more precipitation coming as larger events, which is what we've been seeing in the past and we're gonna see more of in the future. Um, some of the talks you heard today have already referred to that um, in the region. But uh, we're particularly seeing this increase in winter and spring and in fact, we project that the summers will become drier and uh, less precipitation. Uh, and we'll kind of see that. And that's already kind of happening. Um, so this looks at um, temperature. Oh, I don't have the graphic. I'm sorry, that shows you that actually the summers become drier rather than wetter overall. Um, but more precipitation when it does rain or snow is likely to be a larger event than it was in the past because of the additional energy in the atmosphere leading to more significant storms. Um, looking at days above 95 degrees, again, we project an increase uh, at mid-century uh, and even more so, of course, by the end of the century in, in the number of such days. And if we look at the top 1% events, uh, increased by up to 50% by the end of the century for the low scenario, and even much more so for the high scenario. So if we look at what we're trying to do with STAR, um, we are um, um, further working on the model and the capability. Uh, as I mentioned already, we're trying to go beyond looking at um, the continental US, uh, we're extending the model into Canada at the moment, um, but also actually going to planning to do analyses worldwide in the, in the coming months. And um, 
we want to look at a whole series of other indicators beyond what we've looked at. We want to look at um, uh, other data sets that might give us hourly data instead of uh, just uh, T max and T min. Uh, just be able to look at, at, at uh, uh, further resolution uh, and downscale other variables as well, such as humidity and solar radiation, and perhaps winds. Um, and we really want to further improve uh, the treatment of extreme extremes. There's still, as you saw in one of the earlier graphs, there's still some areas where we don't do as perfectly, and we'd like to improve that as much as we can. Um, and uh, we're also looking at how we might merge this with, with dynamical downscale models as well. Two other things. Uh, my colleagues and I did write a book a few years ago called Downscaling Techniques for High Resolution Climate Projections. Uh, won a special award from the American Meteorological Society. And uh, if you want to know more about downscaling and how it can be used, um, that book is a, is a good resource. It's published by Cambridge University Press. And then finally, I want to mention that uh, the University of Illinois will be the host for a uh, major international sustainability research and innovation congress to be held in Chicago on June 16th to 20th, 2025. Um, this is the world's largest transdisciplinary gathering of the global sustainability community. Our focus will be on solutions, and we're hoping to have thousands of people in Chicago for that event. Uh, you'll be hearing more about that. So thank you. Thank you, Don. And we do have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, the, uh, the downscale, downscale, uh, downscale uh, results for the Great Lake from the uh, Simexic directory or using the Wolf downscale? These were, these were from CMIP6 models. So it was all of the CMIP6 models, basically. We're, it's not the downscale model. So we downscaled from CMIP6. To the Great Lake to the, to the, yeah, down to this. Thank we you. did the entire continental U.S., but in this talk, I focused in on the Great Lakes. So, and as and we're also um, soon hope to have actually the Canadian part as well, uh, so you can capture what's going on uh, within those watersheds as well. So um, but, which group? But I don't uh, have that available. Which group are conduct uh, conduct the downscaling uh, research? Which group? Which group? A University of Illinois. Yeah, we did, we did it together through the University of Illinois, Texas Tech, and, um, well, primarily those two universities. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being here today. I appreciate you coming as an invited speaker. Thank you. I'm Debbie Lee, the director of Yes, Coral. yes. Yes, yes, thank good, you. Thank good you very to see much. you. Yes. Um, I have a question. I don't know if it's a correct question, but how does the STAR method differ from, like, for example, machine learning as applied to downscaling? So there's been a number of approaches based on machine learning. The problem is uh, that mo most other techniques, um, with, with a few exceptions, do not capture extremes very well. As I said, essentially all of them get the means pretty well, but as you go further out in the extremes, if you get out past 90% and 99.9 you know, .9 is you know, about as much as we're capable of doing, you start seeing very huge differences. Some of the techniques tend to be too wet, others too dry. Um, ours is kind of a mix. It's almost a peppery look if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the star results, um, but there are still some slight error in, in ours even. And those are all done, by the way, relative to what's called the perfect model. Wait, the reason we can do those analyses of how well we're doing is to look at the GFDL perfect model, um, where basically they train based on, you train both on, based on the past of the model and the future, so you're not making uh, 
to eliminating the, the effects of, of errors in the observations themselves.